Okay. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the second hour of PC 308, Revelation in Daniel. We are currently in Daniel chapter 2. Um, any questions so far in Daniel chapter 2? Um, what we just explained before the break. Where we, um, where we see Daniel speaking of the coming world empires, and not only about the coming world empire, but he foretells about the kingdom of God, heaven, being established on the earth where Christ will rule and reign, which we understand as the millennial rule of Christ on the earth. Any questions on that? Uh, let me just say a few more things, and then maybe we can take questions. Now, how do we interpret the timeline of this? The historical timeline is already done for us, meaning the Babylonian, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. That took care of itself in history, meaning they followed in that same sequence. And so that has already happened. Then he then speaks about the feet, which is a mix of iron and clay. That means something that was part of the Roman Empire, iron, is now intermingling with the rest of humanity, human, the hum, human race, but it's loosely held. And then comes the toe, then are the ten leaders who are going to emerge, Daniel chapter 2, in the days, that's verse 44. Uh, verse 43, they will, Daniel 2, 43, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another. Now, it's, it's very loosely held. And in the days of these kings, when this empire is there, and you have the toes coming, which we later on will understand are ten leaders emerging from this part of the world, where there is this loose, loose mix of what used to be part of the Roman Empire, iron, and clay is all the rest of the people. There's a loose mix there. From them come these ten leaders. In the days of these kings, God will set up a kingdom. Verse 44, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And it's going to be a kingdom which will overpower all, all the preceding empires. So the question is, how do we position this in, in, in terms of timing? How do we interpret it? So first we ask ourselves this question. When Daniel says in verse 44 that God will set up a kingdom, should we position it as Jesus ushering in a spiritual kingdom? That is, when he came as a man and he said, the kingdom of heaven is on earth. Or should we position it in the future when Christ comes and sets up a physical, literal, millennial kingdom, a kingdom on earth for a thousand years? How should we position it? So, we look back at what Daniel is speaking of. He is speaking of earthly empires, literal empires that are ruling on earth. And he's talking about these ten leaders emerging from what used to be part of, it is a mix of the Roman plus the Roman Empire plus people of all other races. So 
he's speaking of a physical, you know, he's talking about physical, literal world empires coming into existence. So when you keep that same train of thought that he's talking about literal empires, he's not talking about spiritual empires, so literal empires. Therefore, when he talks about the God of heaven setting up a kingdom, that has to be a literal kingdom, because we're keeping in the same train of thought. So it's not talking about the spiritual kingdom that Jesus came to, which Jesus did inaugurate when he came to, as recorded for us in the Gospels. But he's talking about a literal kingdom, which we understand in Revelation 20 is the millennial rule and reign of Christ on the earth. So there is going to be that literal reign, but it will happen when? He says, when there, are, when there is this mix of iron and clay, and then there are these 10 leaders who are emerging from there, then God will set up a kingdom, right? So what I'm trying to say is that kingdom that he's speaking of, which God will set up, is a literal kingdom because we're keeping in line with the sequence of thoughts for all the preceding world em uh, empires. These are literal empires. Therefore, the last one also should be a literal empire, which we know will take place. In Revelation 20. The only clue he's giving us is there will be these 10 leaders emerging at that time something will happen, this transition will happen, this change will happen. So that's an interesting thing for us to start looking at and as we go further in Daniel you know there'll be more details given to us for us to look for uh, about when this kingdom will be set up and what it'll look like and so on. Okay so uh, any questions before we move forward? Okay, our next stop is Daniel chapter 5. So, you know, we are skipping some of the historical records in chapter 3 and 4. And we come now to chapter 5. Now, when we come to Daniel chapter 5, time has elapsed. So, we are still in the Babylonian Empire, but now there is Belshazzar who is in charge. He is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar is gone. Hand, you know, the kingdom had changed hands within the Babylonian Empire. And now Belshazzar, who is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, is king or em emperor or ruler. You know, he's in charge. That's Daniel chapter 5. And in his time, there happened to be a day when, you know, Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, was uh, having his party and celebrating and doing all of that. And uh, he was actually using the utensils that they had brought from Jerusalem, from the temple in Jerusalem. And he was, you know, having his party and he was using all of that, this, uh, those consecrated utensils that actually belonged to the temple in Jerusalem. He was, you know, they were drinking wine and whatever was going on. And at that time, there is a hand that comes and writes something on the wall. Right? So, of course, uh, everybody's shocked. What is this? And then somebody remembers saying, hey, there's a wise man. His name is Daniel. He was the one who, you know, interpreted your grandfather. I mean, so in Daniel 5, they use the word father, but that literally is talking about grandfather because in Aramaic, uh, we are told that they didn't have a specific word for grandfather, so it was just a father. So so when you when you read in Daniel 5, the word father, it actually means grandfather. So your father, Nebuchadnezzar, grandfather Nebuchadnezzar, you know, Daniel served him and Daniel helped him understand his dream. So why don't you call Daniel and get Daniel to, you know, explain to us what all of this means. And so we pick up this, the, the incident from there in Daniel chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 17 on to the end of verse 30. Because here comes a little addition to what we have just read in chapter 2. So keep in mind, chapter 2 is the outline. 
as you progress in the book of Daniel, more and more information is being given to all to the outline that we saw in chapter two. So in Daniel five, uh, we have a little bit more information, right? So let's quickly read that. Daniel five, starting from verse seventeen to verse thirty, could uh, you know we just take turns three. Uh, each one can read three verses, and we will look at it, please. Daniel answered the king, Keep your gifts or give them to someone else, but I will tell you what the writing means. Your majesty, the most high God, gave the sovereignty, majesty, glory, and honor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He made him so great that people of all races and nations and language trembled before him in fear. He killed those he wanted to kill and spared those he wanted to spare. He honored those he wanted to honor and disgraced those he wanted to disgrace. Verse 21. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened, so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken away from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his belling was with the wild donkeys, who was fed grass like an ox, and his body wet, was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it, and he will, and you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Verse 23 on, please. Somebody. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You have the goblets from the from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hands hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. Thank you. Next three verses, please, somebody. of the hand was sent from him and this writing was written and this is the inscription that was written many many tekel uparsin this is the interpretation of each word okay? god has uh, numbered your kingdom and finished it tekel you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting thank you 28 to 30, somebody, please. Paris, your kingdom has been divided and given to a Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel and purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler of in, in the kingdom. 30 and 31, please, go ahead. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius, the maid, received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Mm. Thank you. So, so when this handwriting was on the wall, you know, Belshazzar sends for Daniel, and we read what Daniel said, you know, he basically rebuked Belshazzar. He said, you know, you knew what God did in your ancestor, that is your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, how, you know, and, and, and we can read about what happened in Nebuchadnezzar, how he was driven like an animal and then he was restored and all that. So he's basically telling Belshazzar, you knew what happened. 
but you have not feared God. In fact, you have really dishonored God, you know, the, the God of heaven, by you know using these utensils that you've taken from his temple. And so now God himself has sent this hand to write these words. And then Daniel gets the revelation so, you know, of, of what those what that handwriting means. Uh, you know, it's probably like, you know, uh, I was going to say like it's tongues and interpretation, something like that, where there's something that's written in an unknown, unknown language, but there is a meaning that's given that comes by revelation. It's not made up. Daniel wasn't making this up, but it was given to him by revelation. So he, he gives the meaning of each word, basically saying, Belshazzar, God has found you lacking, and your kingdom is going to be handed over to the Medes and Persians. So Daniel now is, see, remember, in chapter 2, he said that after the head of gold, there's going to come another kingdom that is actually weaker than you, that is the Babylonian, uh, the, the Babylonian Empire. They're actually weaker than you, but they're going to take over. They're going to come in after you. That is the chest and arms of silver. In chapter 2, he didn't give the name. He didn't mention the name. But here in chapter 5, Daniel's mentioning, your kingdom, this is in verse 28, he's saying, your kingdom is going to be given over to the Medes and the Persians. He prophesies that. Now, what is very really interesting is that same night, this is very quick, that same night there was the uprising. The Medes and the Persians were around. Now, they were a weaker empire, but he prophesied that's the empire that's going to take over from you. They come in, they are, the Belshazzar is killed, and Darius is appointed in his place, the Medes and Persians, the Medes. The Medes have taken over. The Medes and the Persians, the Medes are a smaller community. The Persians are a bigger community. The Medes came in, took over, and then later on the Persians took over. So, uh, but they're usually clubbed together. Later on, he, they're separate. I mean, he speaks of them in subsequent chapters. He speaks of them separately. But now, they come and they take over. And that's the, the kingdom represented by silver. Okay, so it's a short, Peace. But what I want to point out is now Daniel is specifically saying these people are going to take over, and it happened that same night. Um, the change happened. Say your question, please. Thank you, Pastor. I'm, I'm just kind of curious. Um, like you have rightly said, um, the same day um, Daniel prophesied, the same day um, the Medes and Persians took over. So my, my question would be is, what, was the prophecy in a way um, conditional on who, which king will honor God? Uh, because in a sense, it looks like it could have happened in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, but somehow, somehow he learned his lesson and learned to honor God after going into the forest for seven years. Now we come down to his grandson. Um, now the grandson misbehaves and neglects even what had happened. And then we see prophecy taking place in his own time. So I'm just wondering, could it have been, was the pro prophecy conditional on who was going to dishonor God? Or are, are these just questions that we cannot answer, but we just <laughs> take it as it is? And that's mm. my question. Very, very interesting observation. Very interesting. Um, very good. Um, you know, we don't have an answer to that, but it's a very good observation and it's something to think about, right? Um, that, and it's quite possible. Now, we know this is possible when it comes down to our personal lives, meaning in our personal lives, God gives us a prophecy, or he, he may give us many, you know, uh, instructions and prophecies concerning our personal lives. But at a personal level, it is conditional that we walk with God and then, yes, it'll happen, or the blessing comes, or the answer comes, whatever. 
the, the, the unfolding of God's plan is conditional that we walk with him. And if we disobey, then, you know, we're going to miss out on that. And when we, when we look at something bigger, meaning now we're talking about empires changing, kings changing, and uh, what, how important is the action of a king in honoring God or not honoring, and that causing this prophetic word to be fulfilled? That's a very interesting question. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I, I perhaps it it could you know because what I'm thinking is there is this factor of God's timing, and there is also this factor of this man Nebuchadnezzar doing what he did. So both these are at work, and God has appointed, like Acts 17 says, He appointed the boundaries. He appointed the rise and the fall of nations. So there is that timing involved, but there is also this behavior, actions or behavior of men involved. So somehow both these come together, and you know this transition happens. But all, all, what I would say is a very interesting observation, definitely, uh, and and maybe, and that's this is just my guess that maybe you know Belshazzar's actions did have something to do with this happening right at that time, uh, perhaps to to a large degree, uh, his actions did have something to do. Yeah, but I I, I can't say it for sure because also thinking about the timing of God, you know. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Anything else? Any other thoughts here before we move forward? So chapter 5 is a little short. I just wanted to point out that this transition actually happened on that night. Kennedy's question, where are we in this arrangement of Daniel? Yes. So I, I, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly, but Kennedy, what we are doing is, in chapter 2, Daniel had said, First, there was the image of gold, the head of gold. Then there was another empire who will come. He said, it's a weaker empire, but that empire will take over. That was the chest of silver. So what we're saying is that transition happens here in chapter 5. And in chapter 5, Daniel calls it out. He says, it's the Medes and the Persians who are going to take over from you. And that very night, uh, that's what happened. There was the change. So in in the sequence of events, the second empire has come into place. Yeah, I hope I answered your question, Kennedy. I'm not sure if that's what you were looking for. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now we go to chapter seven. We are skipping chapter six. Now, um, just to point out, you know, I, I these are in the notes, whatever I've shared about chapter five. Um just, just quickly show you. So whatever I've said in chapter 5, it's in the notes. So you could read it, and it, it has some additional details in case you're interested. right? So uh, the other thing I would point out is that Jeremiah did prophesy something to this effect. He, he didn't, um, he didn't uh, specifically mention Medes, but he did say that after Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, uh, uh, nations will serve his son and his son's son, that's his grandson. And then the time comes. So there's a timing involved here. So God has, he set the timing of rise and fall of nations. So there's a timing involved. And then he says that the kings of this empire, Babylon, and they will make him serve them. So that means there's going to be another kingdom will come and overpower. Nebuchadnezzar. So, so Jeremiah prophesied that he foretold that, but didn't, he didn't mention who it is going to be. But he did say, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, son's son. The time comes, things will change. That's interesting. And here Daniel is saying, Medes and Persians are going to take over, and it happened there. Okay, so you can read some of that note. Now we're going to go to chapter seven, which is very interesting. Uh, 
um, and if there are no questions let's go to chapter 7 now we are going to read the whole of chapter 7 okay it's a long chapter and uh, 28 verses but this entire chapter chapter 7 is prophetic information and it is so amazing that in this chapter Daniel is speaking now we said dispensational all right when we said we're going to give a dispensational interpretation here here is an example he's speaking of the immediate or the near he's also speaking about the distant he's speaking about these sequence of empires that are going to transition in the near future but he's also speaking about a time period way in the future when God sets up his kingdom here or not it's a dispensational this is, it's a different dispensation a different time period right so although it is in one chapter chapter 7 although it is in in one book when we interpret it we are saying we are recognizing hey these things belong to this time period and this it's in the same chapter but this part belongs to another time period in another dispensation uh, and that's how we are interpreting it that's how we will interpret it okay and it's very obvious when you read it you will see why okay so let's do this again uh three verses please uh, we'll take turns we've got a long chapter re to read but let's go through it daniel chapter 7 please in the first year of the uh, king of babylon daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts daniel spoke saying I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four, four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four beasts, four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from, and from the other. The first beast was like a lion with eagle wings. As I watched, its wings were pulled off, and it was left standing with its two hind feet on the ground, like a human being. And it was given a human mind. Then I saw a second beast, and it looked like a bear. It was rearing up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And I heard a voice saying to it, Get up, devour the flesh of the many people. Then the third of this strange beast appeared, and it looked like a leopard. It had four bird wings on its back, and it had four heads. Great authority was given to its beast. Thank you. Verse 7 onwards, somebody, please. Three verses. Seven, verse 7 on. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron strength. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which Three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the head of his head like pure wool. His throat was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire, a stream of fire, Issued and came out. So I think it's over. Running fire. It's Thank okay. you. Okay, oh. sir. A stream of the fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand, thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Mm. Thank you. Verse eleven onwards. Somebody please. And I, I come then because. Just go ahead, brother. Go ahead, Abinas. Okay, thank you. I watched then because of sound of the pompous words 
which the horn was speaking, I was till the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beast, they had their dominion to take taking away, and yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient day, and they brought him near before him. Then to then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that shall that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Mm. Thank you. Was 15 onwards, somebody? I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and, in the, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth, but, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever. Thank you. Next three verses, please, somebody. Then I wish to know the truth about the four beast, which is different from all the others. Exceedingly dreadful with its, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth, which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints, and prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thank you. Verse 23 onwards, somebody, please. Those please continue, Siddhan. Those he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it. In pieces. The ten home are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. The saints shall be given into his hand. For a king, for a time and times and half a time. Thank you. Verse 26, 27. But the courts shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to conceive and destroy it forever. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms and of the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my confidence changed. But I kept the matter in my heart. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. So, chapter seven. Like we said earlier, you know, some of the um, imagery in Daniel, the book of Daniel, is quite um, shocking or it's you know it's 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 not even normal kinds of images that we would see so daniel of course he says you know uh, this is when he had this vision daniel 7 verse 1 and he had recorded it right so he's kind of just going back in time saying look uh, i had this vision during belshazzar's time 
and uh, this is what I had and I wrote down the facts I wrote down what I saw and in the first part that is still verse 8 he's actually seeing these images and these images are quite shocking because he's seeing the four winds of heaven now the four winds of heaven are really you know many when, when you think about the term the four winds let's just cross reference and we go to um, the gospel of mark um, let me give you the exact verse mark 13 because jesus explains four winds over there let me just find that exact verse mark 13 uh, mark 13 27 so uh, mark chapter 13 verse 27 now jesus is talking about the end times again very interesting and then he says you know i'll just read verse 26 27 it says mark 13 26 27 then they will see the son of man coming in the clouds with great power and glory and then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds so what are the four winds well he explains from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven so the four winds referring it just talks about the work of god so when you say the four winds what are the four winds the four winds really referring to the work of god that covers all of earth and heaven the farthest part of earth the farthest part of heaven and in this particular context of, of mark 13 uh, it is that God's elect, all of God's people will come together wherever they are. That means whether they're in heaven or whether they're on earth, they're all going to come together. They're all going to be gathered together. But how are they going to be gathered together? The four winds. The four winds. That means it's the work of God that it's like sweeping through all of heaven, all of earth. So keep that in mind. Right? Mark 13, 26, 27. Go back to Daniel 7. So he says, I saw the four winds of heaven were stirring upon the great sea. That means there is the movement of God, movement of God all throughout heaven and earth. So God is moving throughout heaven. And earth. So what is the four winds? It's the move of God, the movement of God throughout heaven and earth. So the four winds are moving heaven and earth. And now in verse 2, he's saying it was stirring up the great sea. Interesting. What is the great sea? In biblical imagery, the great sea refers to the nations. How do we know that? Cross-reference, Revelation 17, um, verse 1 and verse 15. So if you go with me to Revelation 17, um, verse 1, <coughs> John has this vision. He see it, <coughs> Sorry. He says, um, he sees this angel, he sees this great harlot who sits upon many waters. Revelation 17, 1. Many waters, the great sea. What is that? Verse 15. Then he said to me, Revelation 17, 15. The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are people's multitudes, nations, and tongues. Revelation 17, verse 15. So, what? The four winds, it's the move of God from all of heaven, all of earth, through all of heaven, through all of earth. It's stirring up the great waters. Back in Daniel 7, 2, the great sea, are the great waters. What is that? It's symbolic, figurative of nations. So this, this God is stirring up the nations. God is doing something among the nations. That is Daniel 7, verse 2. So this is happening across the nations. What happens? He is seeing a sequence of beasts. And that is where it's so strange. Daniel 7, right? And uh, he's seeing four beasts that are coming in sequence, one after the other, from the sea, meaning from the nations, from among the peoples, one after the other. These four beasts are coming. And they're all very different, distinct. So he begins to describe what he sees. Right? So there is one like a lion uh, with eagle 
wings, there's a bear and ribs in his mouth and so on. And um, there's a leopard, verse 6. And there's a fourth, which is a very powerful beast. And uh, it's very, very strong. And this fourth beast has ten horns. And verse 8, while he was looking at the ten horns, he sees another horn, little one, that emerges and then begins to speak pompous things against the Most High. So, what is it? Right. So, like we said earlier, the interpretation is in the chapter itself. So he sees now, verse 9 on through verse 14, he's seeing something else happening. He's seeing heaven opened, and he's seeing something happen in heaven. So Daniel chapter 7, verses 2 to 8, is what's happening in the great sea that is on the earth. Daniel 7, 9 to 14, is happening heaven and how earth is relating to heaven. Okay, but then let's interpret the images of the beasts. What are those beasts? The interpretation is given for us in chapter 7 and verse 17. So Daniel asks this angel, you know, what is this? What is all this about? Well, what, are, what are these beasts? And the angel says, verse 17, the great beasts that are four kings or kingdoms that are going to arise out of the earth. Are among the nations. So the interpretation is there. Each of these beasts, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and this fourth dreadful beast, each of them are representing a kingdom. Now immediately we begin to see a parallel with what he saw in chapter 2. In chapter 2, in this image, there was gold, silver, bronze, iron for empires here he's seeing a lion a bear a leopard and a dreadful beast four beasts so there's a parallel immediately now in daniel 2 he saw 10 toes obviously from the 10 two feet here he's seeing 10 horns but then there is more information here in chapter 7, which he did not see in chapter 2. Because he sees, in addition to the ten horns, he's seeing another little horn coming up. So that's additional information. And in chapter 2, he just saw a kingdom that came from heaven, established on the earth. In chapter 7, it's getting into the details. What is this kingdom? You know. It's this, the Ancient of Days, it's the Son of Man, and it's the Saints of the Most High. That's the kingdom. Okay? And when is it going to happen? He sees that when this little horn that comes, after the ten horns come, then there's a little horn, and this little horn is speaking pompous things against God that time God is going to come and he's going to set up this kingdom. So there is additional details, additional information building up on the outline given in chapter 2 being given here in chapter 7. Okay, So we're going to, we, we need to study this a little bit more in detail. Chapter 7, uh, you know, I'm looking at the clock and it says only five more minutes. So now we will have to get back into chapter 7 next week, we want to look at the details given to us, right? But what I want to point out is, within chapter 7, there is the interpretation. You read about the beasts, well, then he says, hey, the beasts are four kingdoms. They're representing four kingdoms, okay? So like that, uh, we will look at what are the ten horns? What is that little horn? And so on. The interpretation is within the chapter itself. Say, so, let's take your question, please. Yes, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Um, it seems like chapter seven actually precedes um 
precedes um, chapter five. Yes, in yes. In the sense that it was done before, it was done in the first year of Belshazzar, which was the grandson to Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. So it looks like a follow up, a sequence after the dream with Nebuchadnezzar, then God now shows him more information about. Okay. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, so he begins that in chapter 7, verse 1. He's saying, uh, you know, I had this actually, you know, in the first year, and I wrote it down, I made a note of it, and this is his, what he's telling us, like what he made a note of. But you're right, right? So this happened prior to, uh, but he's giving it to us. I mean, it's written down for us in chapter 7, and it's like... God is expanding on what was given in chapter 2. God is expanding on it, chapter 7. Then when we get into, you know, like when we get into chapter 8, chapter 9, more and more information in subsequent visions are given to Daniel that are actually expanding the outline of chapter 2. And um, then chapter 11, gives more information about immediate events that were going to happen. And chapter 12 goes way out into the future. Um, again, information on that. All right, but uh, it's very interesting. Let's come back to chapter 7 next week and look at the details, All right? So next week, when we start in chapter 7, uh, we won't read the whole chapter because, again, it'll take time. So we'll just come in and start explaining, okay? Uh, so it might be useful if you just kind of quickly review chapter seven so that you have the, you know, what was written there, you have it in mind, uh, because we're not going to read the whole chapter. We'll just come in and start explaining what we read today, okay? So if you can do a little bit of reading before the class, it'll just give you a context uh, when we start um, explaining pieces of those images. But the beautiful thing is the details are explained within the chapter itself. It's the meaning is there, and we can we can, we can understand what God has spoken, right? Any other questions? Shri Kumar, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I want to know about the the wind of God. Um, I need a little more clarification on that. As you said, that it is the it is the work of God. Uh, is it the same thing? What it ex what um, the Bible says in Exodus ten thirteen and ten nineteen that uh, the east wind and the west wind when the Moses stretched the staff uh, towards the Red Sea and also um, you know the ten nineteen says that the west wind which took away the locust and uh, so is it the same? Uh, same uh, can we uh, consider the same thing, or is it something else? Thank you, sir. Mm. Good. So the answer is yes. So when you trace through the Bible, like you know, like you pointed out, uh, we can actually go from Genesis through the Bible. Then we see wind, a God breathing, or wind being used. The typology of wind. We will see it's in some way talking about God doing something, the work of God. So Genesis, God breathed into man. Like you pointed out in the book of Exodus, there is the wind of God, you know, parting the waters. There's a wind of God bringing in quails, blowing in the quails and things like that. And then when you come into the New Testament, there is the sound of a rushing mighty wind, Holy Spirit coming. So like that, you know, when we trace through the Bible, the wind of God, it is a typology of the work of God. And then you have something very specific, like the four winds. And what is interesting is even Jesus uses that same terminology. And he says, look, it's the ingathering, it's the bringing in of all of God's people from heaven and earth. You know, that means, so, so that's how we... We can, uh, it's so it is very good to look at typology throughout scripture and then with very with a lot of confidence we can say this is what 
it represents. So when we say wind, or when we say the four winds, we can say with confidence, it's speaking about the work of God. It's speaking about God doing something. Right? Because you see it throughout the scriptures. Yeah. Okay. Thank, um, you. thank you. I know we've gotten into our break. Somebody could pray and close, and then we will go for a break, and I'll meet you in the next class, next course. Somebody could pray and dismiss us, please. Our Father and our Lord, we bless you and thank you for another class. Lord, thank you for your son who you've used to open us up to scripture of the things before, of the things now, and of the things that are to come. We pray that by the Spirit of God, as we journey along, Lord, to open up the prophetic words, O oh Lord, that you have given from time before, that we may, Lord, position ourselves rightly, Lord, to be able to meet with you at the end and be part of your kingdom in the end. We pray, Father, give us understanding and wisdom to decode these words, O oh Lord, and also to be useful verses to open others to your light and to your truth in your word. We bless you, Father. We give you praise. As we go into our next class, we ask for wisdom and we pray that, Lord, all that we do will be, will be unto your glory and it will be beneficial to our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a break and I'll meet you in the other class. Nice to meet all of you again. God bless. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you.